to the Watering Creatives Podcast. I'm your host, Ali Kutz, and joining me for today's episode is documentary filmmaker Kat Brewer. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. I'm super excited. Super excited to talk to you. Likewise. I am so pumped to have you on the podcast, and it's it's funny because I like every single person that I've been talking to here in Wilson, North Carolina was like, oh, have you met Kat Brewer? Do you know Kat? What about Kat? You should have Kat on the podcast. And I'm like, who is this person? What are they doing? Like, I, you know, I got to figure it out. And we were finally, we kind of like bumped into each other yeah. um, at, the, at, at the edge. At the edge. Yeah. And I was like, this is the person that everyone has been telling me to meet. So I was, I, you know, ecstatic to be able to connect and have a pod. And thank you. Now I know why everyone was saying that I had to have you on. I don't know. People here in Wilson are so nice. Like, and I, I feel like sometimes they pump me up way more than they should to people. Cause I'm like, ah, like, you know, like when someone like, like sees a movie and they're like oh my god it was like the best movie ever you gotta like watch it and then you go and you're like really like that that's what you told me to go see so I'm like I don't I like I wish people wouldn't talk about me like that but it's very it's very kind it's very I mean you've done something pretty amazing especially for like like the Wilson area I guess right like (laughs) It's, it's, you've been on like national television, you've been in like big publications. I mean, it's, a, it's a pretty big deal. You're a big deal cat. <laughs> oh, just in your perception. So to, to, to kind of let our listeners know, Kat, you, you have a really fantastic story and this experience that you've um, had over the last like seven plus years of filming and making the documentary sign the show, which focuses on deaf culture, access, and entertainment. And I am really excited to learn more about your filmmaking experience because I'm sure like seven and a half years is a long time to be like out on the road interviewing people and like really immersing yourself in deaf culture, which had to be an amazing experience to have. So yeah, um, definitely. I just can't wait. And like, I watched the trailer on your website and it gave me like goosebumps. And I, I like Aww. have goosebumps right now just talking about it. It's a really inspiring story that you are covering and telling. So it's, Thanks. yeah, I can't wait to just learn more. And then also to be able to stream the documentary when it yes. um, comes out. You and me both. So to get started, share with us. Um, a little bit about what Sign the Show is about. So the film is about the challenges and barriers that the deaf and hard of hearing community face when trying to access or get access to live entertainment. And I focused live entertainment on comedy, music, and theater. And I, I do that in a way that's hopefully educational it's hopefully lighthearted and you know may make you laugh may make you cry but my whole goal really is to educate with my film and to hopefully make access to live entertainment easier for this very much underserved population i think only in the last couple of years is we've maybe seen a little bit more of the interpreters and things like that at concerts but yeah this it, yeah, just thinking about it, I, I really was looking back and I'm like, yeah, that's not really something that like you hear a lot about or see a lot of. So it was really interesting to come across and to learn more about Sign the Show. And like I said, I'm I'm honestly like really excited to to see it when it's available because I think it's a really important story and, and aspect of I want to say like concert going, but that's not the, that's not the right thing, yeah, but just, like just having access to entertainment yeah, in general. So. Exactly. Yeah. And I think, you know, for years I worried about I'm not I'm not finishing this fast enough. I'm not doing this fast enough. It's not going to get out fast enough. And I really had to just kind of be like, okay. <laughs> My girlfriend Stephanie always says to me, in God's time. Right. I have other friends who say aligned timing or divine timing. 
so I really had to kind of like step back and let that go, especially because I really didn't know anything about the filmmaking process. Mm -hmm. And I think my film is coming out at a perfect time, especially with CODA winning at Sundance Film Festival, everybody's dream, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and winning an Oscar, especially having Troy Kotzer win for Best Supporting Actor. It's amazing. It's only the second time a deaf person has ever won an Oscar with Marley Matlin being the first. Mm -hmm. So while that movie has brought attention to the deaf community as you know a family unit, and some of the challenges that that family went through, I think my film obviously takes a much broader perspective and it it's a real life in the sense that it's a documentary as opposed mm -hmm. to, you know, a, <laughs> I don't know, a big yeah. budget film, right? And so I just, I feel like my friends say, the timing is right. It's going to happen. And I just have to keep having faith in that <laughs> sometimes. My faith wavers a little bit, but I just keep moving forward. Just keep moving forward. Yeah. And I, I do I do think, yeah, like the timing, because again, in the last couple of years, we've seen movies like what, The Quiet Place. What was the other one? Sound of Silent. Metal. Yes. Yeah, so there's been like a, a little bit of an increase in kind of mm -hmm. visibility of, of hard of hearing folks and, and deaf culture and, and deaf people. So yeah, I think your show or sign the show will kind of be like the the cherry on top because I think people, <laughs> well, I think people forget like, you know, hard hearing people or deaf people still enjoy the things that everyone else enjoys, which includes yeah. music yeah. Um, and comedy and just entertainment in general. But I don't think that's anything that's really been explored or talked about before. So I think your documentary, like you said, it's come along like at the right time. There's been this uptick and, kind of visibility yeah. so I'm I'm excited to see like I'm I'm yeah I'm gonna be watching it just take off because I fully believe that it will from your lips to the universe yeah. ears <laughs> you just gotta put it out there put it out yeah. in the universe and so I'm kind of curious like what was it that inspired you to start this journey seven plus years ago was there a, a moment or an incident that just like yeah. spoke to you and you had to do yeah. something about it? Yeah. So I'm I'm gonna be 51. By the time this airs, I will be 51 years old. <laughs> and I've been attending concerts since I was about eight years old, mm. maybe even a little bit younger. I've always loved music. And throughout my entire life, music and comedy have always gotten me through life like the mm -hmm. joyous times and also the really tough times and in 2014 I went to a concert uh, it was Gavin DeGraw and <laughs> I was just like oh I love him love him love his music and for the very first time I saw a sign language interpreter mm -hmm. interpreting the concert signing the show and I was my I think like most hearing people who've never seen a sign language interpreter do, at a live performance, my mind, my head exploded. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh my gosh, what is going on? I mean, I knew what was going on, but yeah. I was like, I want to know, I want to know what she's, what she's signing. I mean, obviously she was signing the music, but I wanted to understand that better. And I was completely ignorant. I didn't realize that deaf people enjoyed music. I think like my only experience with that was seeing Mr. Holland's opus years ago, but I didn't realize deaf people enjoyed music, let alone enjoyed going to live performances. Mm -hmm. So after I started talking to the interpreter and then started communicating with the deaf people there through the interpreter, because I didn't know any sign language, I learned of all of these challenges and barriers that people in this community face when trying to access live entertainment. And I was heartbroken and my eyes were opened at the same time to my hearing privilege, mm -hmm. right? I've never had to 
request access at a comedy show, a music concert, or a play. And for me, I've been a teacher for 22 years. I've taught communication courses, mostly Mm -hmm. public speaking, some interpersonal communication. And I was like, I'm going to write an article about this because it is another form of communication that I really didn't give any thought to. And just about like barrier, I talk a lot about barriers to communication in my classes, especially intercultural barriers, which could be ethnicity, it could be religion, it could be socioeconomic status, it could also be you know sexual orientation or identity. And so I, I really wanted to shed some light on this subject matter. So I called a friend at the Oakland Tribune and I was like, hey, if I, I wrote an article for the school newspaper for Laney College, will you publish it in the Oakland Tribune? <laughs> and he was like, yeah, this sounds great. So I was then telling another friend, my roommate at the time, about what I was going to do. And he's like, you should make a documentary. And I like paused for like a minute and I was like, Oscar, like I have, you know, that like I have no background whatsoever in filmmaking. And he's like, yeah, but this is a story that needs to be told. And I was going through a really difficult time in my life. I was going through a, a separation after like 15 years of marriage. and. I was just like, sure, why don't, why don't I like, well, I'm going to make a documentary. <laughs> and I had seen a movie years ago. It was about this young guy who wanted to go on a date with Drew Barrymore. And he, I can't think of it. I think it's like my date with Drew or something like that. <laughs> and he literally, I remember this because it stuck in my head. He went and he bought a camera and he was like, I'm going to save the receipt because I'm going to return it. And that's what I did. Like I went down to Best Buy, like talked the guy's ear off for like two hours. I had no (laughs) idea what I needed. And then in my head, I was like, I can't afford an $800 camera. I'm going to save the receipt and return it in 30 days. Mm -hmm. Eight years later, I still have that camera. (laughs) I was really naive that I could create a film in 30 days. That did not happen. It was seven and a half years from the time I got the idea and bought my camera to completing it July 30th of 2021. Yeah, it's been the highest of highs and the lowest of lows and sometimes in the exact same day. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Literally, and I would not change it for the world. It's been a tremendous adventure, a tremendous learning experience. And it has, it has filled me with joy, not yeah. every day, all day, but most days. I mean, what an amazing experience. Like I can't even imagine it in my head, like what it was like. And also just like to have the guts to be like, yeah, you know what? <laughs> I am going to do that. I am going to like make a documentary. It's going to happen. And to just, and to do it. Like a lot of people will say that they're going to do something and they might buy the equipment and like do a little bit of it, but to, to say you're going to do it, commit to it in the seven and do it for seven and a half years and you stuck with it. And now you have this just amazing documentary that is, I mean, something I'm really interested in seeing is how the conversation changed throughout those seven years, because I'm sure like when you first started, it was, you know, probably something not a lot of people have thought about, but then like maybe throughout the years, those opinions have changed and people maybe became a little more familiar with it. So I'm excited to see the journey through the film. (laughs) Yeah. I think the one thing that did not change still is these challenges and barriers and Mm -hmm. the fact that deaf people have known this their entire lives. Right. And so it, it, one of the people in the film, my friend, Julie, she's deaf. And she says like, how do we get more people to, to have this aha moment to realize that they have this hearing privilege and then how do we make things more accessible for everyone? And that's part of the journey of the film is, is discussing that from different points of view, not only from deaf and hard of hearing folks, but also from sign language interpreters, and then the artists 
that mm -hmm. these people are trying to see the 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 singers, the musicians, the theater actors and comedians. So I what I lacked in knowledge about filmmaking, I definitely made up for I think with my knack for communicating mm -hmm. and hustling. Like I love like yeah, I I always talk about hustling with gratitude and love for every experience that you have good and bad like there is some way to find gratitude for the experience whether it was a good thing and you learned from it or whether it was a bad thing and you learned for it uh learn from it so I love that. yeah that's good yeah. hustle with gratitude i like that yeah my film really focuses on and this is interesting i had a discussion with a woman the other day who um, is the executive director of a hearing and communication center. And she was like, I love your film. She's like, I've been involved in this community for 37 years. And I, I learned new things from your film, which was fantastic for me to hear. Mm. But I also learned, because she said, you know, your film really focuses on sign language interpreting and access through interpreters. She's like, but not every deaf and hard of hearing person signs. And I was like, well, yes, I know that. And she's like, mm -hmm. I would have loved to have heard a little bit more about, you know, live captioning or even just regular captions. And I was like, oh, you know, like, can I go? <laughs> I'd love to go back and make another cut of my film. Uh, do a prequel cool. or a sequel. And, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, yeah, part two, right? It's funny. Mm -hmm. there, have been, there have been folks who I haven't been able to interview for various reasons, timing or just didn't work out. And one of my girlfriends, Rukia, always says it to me, Rukia and Stephanie both, part two, this is part 2.0, sign the show 2.0. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. You know, I've said that I have no desire to make another film <laughs> because I think had I known then, back in 2014, what I know now about it, I probably would have never I, I would have never said I was going to do it, but I mean, like I said, I wouldn't change anything about it, but it's definitely been challenging. There have mm -hmm. been a lot of challenges as a filmmaker. And, you know, I think some of them might have been easier had I had background and experience, but I think some of them would have been just the same, mm -hmm. regardless if I had experience or not. I mean, maybe if I had a, like a team of people to help me as opposed to it just being yeah. myself. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, you know, some extra people might have been. <laughs> yeah, right? Like, you know, someone to, I get people all the time like, oh, you should interview Lady Gaga. You should interview Pink. And I'm like, yes, I should. Do you have their number? Right. Like, how do we <laughs> like, contact with them? <laughs> like, I, yeah, I was like, you know, like I had to hustle for every single interview that I got. And and some of that was like, don't get me wrong. Like I DM'd Lady Gaga, I DM'd Pink, mm -hmm. I tweeted these people, but that's how I got a lot of my interviews was messaging on Instagram, messaging on Twitter. You know, these people didn't know who I was. Power <laughs> uh, sneaking, social media. Yeah, it's... sneaking backstage at concerts. And for me, that was like where I lived at the time in the Bay Area. It, it was fertile with music and comedy. There's an amazing comedy scene in San Francisco, great music scene in Oakland and, and the Bay Area. And so, you know, like I went where I could, where I could easily drive, you know, 40 minutes or whatever, wait back, you know, wait outside of a comedy club and try to ask someone, Hey, can I get 30 seconds of your time? Here's my elevator pitch. Will yeah. you do this? You know? So, <laughs> but if I had like a whole team that was like, you know, I don't know, I keep dreaming that there's like this database out there that like all the, the L Illuminati. Right. <laughs> like, it's like the, the PR yeah. Illuminati. <laughs> right. Yes, exactly. Like, Oh yeah. You want to talk to them? Let me just pick up my phone. You know, but I didn't, I didn't have that. So I got who I could get which was not Lady Gaga. <laughs> I mean, but you I got, got Kelly Clarkson. Lot of people, though. Yeah, yeah you got I got Kelly Clarkson. I got D.L. Hughley. I got Andre 3000 and Chuck D. Chuck D was like a whole two years of back and forth on Twitter. 
like literally DMing each other for two mm-hmm. years before I got that interview with him. And it just yeah. lined up. It just happened. That's persistency, like embodied <laughs> in person. Like two years of just going back and forth with someone. On t- I mean... It's, it, I think it's truly like a testament to like your passion and devotion to the topic to be able to to do that. Like you said, you hustled hard for like seven and a half years yeah. and got, I mean, you really got some amazing Thanks. interviews. Like I was, yeah. I was looking at everyone that is included in the documentary and I was and like, holy shit. <laughs> like, yeah. I like it. It's funny because there's there's two people in the film. One of them is she's an interpreter. Her name is Holly Maniotti. And I mean, you go anywhere on the Internet and you see her interpreting like she's interpreted for Public Enemy, for Paul McCartney. Like, I I think Paul McCartney. I mean, literally everybody. And I didn't know her. And I kept trying to reach out, trying to reach out. And then she like, wouldn't reply, wouldn't reply, wouldn't reply. And finally, I was like, I don't know how it happened, but I finally like convinced her. She's like, do you want to do FaceTime? We'll do a FaceTime call so I could, you know. And in her kitchen, we I remember this. She was like, okay, like, I get it. Like, I get what you're doing. I'll give you the interview. Like, I had to work hard to get my interview with her. And I had to work just as hard to get my interview with Matt Maxey, who's now my, one of my executive producers. And, you know, I stalked him on social media for, like, for two years and, you know, and, and he's deaf. And so I was like, how do I communicate with them? We were like, Snapchat, Facebook. I mean, yeah. And I'm, I think I'm almost most proud of my interview with him and the friendship and partnership that we have created with each other these last, like, I think it's been four. I met him for the first time in 2017. Yeah. So five years. Yeah. He's been with me on this journey. I think we've been, we always say that we are floating on parallel paths. He's floating much higher than I am. (laughs) He's amazing. And I adore him. He knows I, I love him with all my heart. But I'm really proud of that interview. And I've learned so much from him about the deaf community and just about his own hustle and with his with his company called Definitely Dope, D-E-A-F, Definitely Dope, and his, you know, journey to also break down barriers and build bridges between the deaf and hearing communities. I have to say personally, I was very excited to see that you got an interview with with Niall, who was on America's Next Top Model, because I remember yes. watching that season and I was just in love with him. I thought it was just so amazing. The, I remember there's an episode where I think they had to pose to music or something, or there was a whole conversation around like being able to feel the vibrations and the yes. beat and the music. And I remember that being a moment for me where I was like, oh my God. Like, yeah. whoa, because that was, I think, maybe the first time I witnessed or heard a conversation around music and deafness. And I, yeah. It, yeah, it was like a whole moment for me. And also I was like, he's really good looking too. So it's yeah. amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And he is just as good looking in person <laughs> as he is on television. And I actually interviewed him down in LA before they even announced the winner of America's oh, Next wow. Top Model. So he was still in that process, like still going through it and couldn't talk about it at all. Mm-hmm. But I snagged that interview with him pretty early on, pretty early on in the in the filmmaking process. Yeah. That's amazing. I mean, what a wild ride. Like I said earlier, I mean, you have been able to interview some amazing folks but then you yourself have been interviewed on like you were you were featured this was with Kelly Clarkson yeah <laughs> Kelly Clarkson right you were featured in like yeah. e-news I think which so that was okay <laughs> like that was interview me I will say it was that was crazy so again with Kelly it was almost I had asked her to be in the film I'd snuck backstage gotten a meet and greet line 
my my friend Akila will say that I did not sneak backstage, but I kind of did. I do it, do did what I got to do. I approached her. I'd re- been reaching out to her management for like three months, and they kept telling me no, 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 no. So then I was like, I just can get to her face to face and ask, and I did. And she was like, yes, contact my management company. And I was like, but I have for the last three months, and they've told me no. And she was like, no, you tell them that. I said so. And I was like, oh my God. Okay. So I like almost a year later, I went, flew to Nashville. They called and they were like, Hey, like we could do this interview or she could do this interview in like three days. And I was like, okay, I'm like, I'm in North Carolina. I'll fly home to Oakland, get my camera and then fly to Nashville, which I did. And so after we filmed the interview, I like asked to take a selfie with her and I like I posted it on my social media, just thanking her for like honoring her word, like keeping her word to me, you know, a whole year. So she went through her pregnancy. And so somehow, I don't know how, but somehow when I posted that picture, like all these news outlets caught wind of it. And it was like the very first picture of her since she'd had her baby. Mm-hmm. Like that's what it was about. It was it wasn't about you were on myself, there, but I was like... on there, and they had clearly like I think they had they really they basically copied and pasted my post thanking her and put it on. And I like one of my former students had like messaged me, and she's like, "Oh my god, you're like on Yahoo homepage," and I was like, "What are you talking about?" Like. And then other people, I, I was like laying out at a pool. I had no mm. idea. Like I pick up my phone and I look and I was like, oh shit. And then like I started crying because I was like, oh my God, like this is amazing. Mm. <laughs> you know, yeah. that, that lasted all of about 15 minutes, you know, and then it was back to the grind of, you know, trying awesome. to get more interviews and get more funding and finishing the film. Yeah. Yeah, and to, to talk a little bit about your filmmaking journey, because this was your first everything. Like, <laughs> yeah. you, and yeah. I mean, did you do like the, because you obviously you did the, the filming yourself, you did the booking yourself. Did you also like when it comes to like the editing? <laughs> <laughs> I laugh because I really had no clue. I really, <laughs> so, so yeah, so I did, I did almost all of the filming. I did, there was maybe like 6% of the filming that I didn't do. Like one time I couldn't make it to South by Southwest festival where Matt and Holly were presenting on a panel. So I hired one of Matt's friends to film it. I hired one of my former students to film because I know he was in filmmaking Malik and he couldn't do it. So he referred to of his friends, but yeah, I filmed everything and you can, it's gritty. We like to say some of the footage is gritty. You could tell the very first interview that I did with Michael Franti compared to the last interview I did. I was like, oh yeah, I finally figured out how to work a camera, (laughs) right? Or lighting or sound. And it's funny when I first hired and like social media, I know people complain about it and it definitely has its dark corners. But for me, social media has been an amazing resource for this film. So there was, can I, if this story gets too long, Allie, please feel free to edit it out. But I think that this is, it's either a story of the power of social media and how the universe connects people. So I had no idea where to start looking for an editor. This was in 2019. And thanks to the guy who ghosted me in 2019 after dating me for a year, because that was kind of the emphasis for, no, no, it's all good. Everything works out for the best. (laughs) We're friends now, (laughs) but he ghosted me and it lit a match. It lit the fire to be like, okay, next. Okay. Anyway, I digress. So I had no idea where to go for editing went back in the day there used to be a tv show called undateable produced by bill lawrence who produced scrubs and cougar town and i was infatuated with this tv show it was basically like comedians it was like brent morin ron funches chris d'elia bianca i can never can pronounce her last name but anyway it's just an amazing cast rick glassman they're all comedians so they kind of like impromptu like improv off of one another uh 
so I would go down and watch taping of this show because it brought me so much joy. And I just, I loved the cast and the producers. All of them were amazing. Bill Lawrence now does a Ted Lasso. Oh, nice. So yeah, he, Kip Kroger, Ted, these guys are amazing. So I would go down and just, you know, be looking at them. And so somehow like befriended them on Facebook. <laughs> So when I was looking for an editor, I was like, I have no idea where to start. And I was like, well, I know Bill Lawrence on Facebook. So I'm going to like look through his people, look through his friends and see who's an editor because I have no idea. And I found this guy. Yeah, like I found this guy named um, Damon Gordon, who's no longer here. He passed Mm -hmm. away December 2020. But I found his profile, we connected on Facebook Messenger, and I was like, I don't know what to do. Can you help me? Can I hire you? Like what? I I have no money, but can I hire you? (laughs) And um, he was like, I'm going to send you five reels, and you tell me who you like the best as far as editing. And I was like, okay. So he sends me these five reels, and I pick one. And then he made this introduction to this young kid. He was a young kid at the time. I think he was like 23 or 24, maybe. His name is Kai, Kai Keith. And Kai was like, great, I'm in. Let's do this. We have like a whole, we have like a team meeting. And he's like, do you have like a, not a storyboard, but I forget, I don't even know what the name of it is. Like, you know, baby, basically, do you have like a screenplay or whatever? Not a screenplay. I can't see. Like I'm a, like a super I, cut or something of the. Or like, do you have, I, I don't want to use the word outline because he didn't ask for an mm. outline, but he wanted like, do you have an idea, a storyboard? We'll just use that word, a yeah. storyboard of the film. And I was like, no, but mm-hmm. I'll get you one. <laughs> so. I had no idea what this is. I Googled it and I was like, I can't do this. I don't. So what I basically did was I used an outline format for a persuasive speech by, it's called Monroe's Motivated Sequence. All of my students, my speech students out there, I use Monroe's Motivated Sequence to put together a rough draft outline, like in two days to send it to my editor. And then I sent him 55 hours of footage on a hard drive. And that was it. And I was like, here you go, Kai. Good luck. <laughs> like, I'll take a look at this and, you know, get you a string cut or, you know, rough cut, whatever. And I was like, okay. And I tell him this all the time. He knows I say this about him. He literally was my angel because he sent me back a cut. And the first cut was like maybe two hours long. And I just started crying. Like, I was like, oh my God, he gets my vision. And like, I saw it, like I saw it come. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's very different from that first cut to this last cut, but he has been true to me and my vision. And he has the patience of a saint. Yeah. And we, so we worked together from 2019 to 2021, just over zoom and it going through cut after cut after cut and editing and editing and editing. And then I finally got to meet him in 2021 in July. He flew out to Los Angeles to be in the studio with me to, to finish the film. And I, I wouldn't have wanted to share that with anyone but him and Matt, who'd been on the journey with me. Yeah, it was incredible. Like I had That's no so idea. I had people were like, do you have a line producer? And I was like, I don't know what that is. What is, <laughs> I'm going to do your budget. Well, I never had any money to do a budget. Now I have some money. So I guess I'm hiring a line producer. <laughs> like, thank you, Sonia. Um, you need a, what was they called? A post-production supervisor. I have no idea what that is. <laughs> Let me figure that. Like it was all these little weird connections. You need to hire someone to score the film. And I'm like, fuck. Like, yeah, it was literally baptism by fire I guess or I love it I'm I'm I mean I am always so impressed I've I've interviewed several filmmakers and I'm I'm always so impressed by just like I don't want to say like the balls right so just like (laughs) yeah because you like you throw yourself in there you kind of like pour yourself into this project and you know sometimes it takes years sometimes it's like oh we have two weeks to shoot an entire movie like let's go and yeah. then 
you have to, like you said, it's like trial, trial by fire. Like you have to figure out like, okay, so I've got this film. Now I've got to edit it, the score. Now I've got to try to like get distribution, which is like a huge issue for indie filmmakers. Yeah. It's like That's yeah. probably like the number one thing <laughs> with talking to filmmakers. Like they're all like, yeah, it's great. We're on the, we're doing the festival circuit, but now it's distribution and that's something that like not a lot of people talk about and they don't really like teach you about when it comes to filmmaking is how to yeah. get it out there now that you yeah. need it. So I imagine yeah. you're coming up on that. Again, from your lips to the universe's <laughs> ears, right? My whole goal when I started this, so like I said, I've been a teacher for 22 years. I've been an adjunct teacher for 22 years. There's a big difference here, which means I'm Mm part-time. I don't get the same pay as my full-time counterparts, even though I teach the exact same thing and the exact same Mm -hmm. load. I'm not bitter at all. I'm just pointing out some of the disparities, right? I don't, I like have to pay for my benefits if I get them, if I'm given enough classes to teach. I Mm -hmm. don't really get the same kind of pension. So why did I bring that up? Because (laughs) You were saying distribution, right? So my goal was that I wanted to take this film on a tour. Mm. Um, my, my first thought was like, I want to go to different college campuses, show the film and talk about accessibility issues. And I want to do this, not, not just me, because this isn't my experience, right? My experience is creating the film, mm. but I want to bring my friend Matt with me and I want to bring an interpreter with me. And I want to bring, you know, another deaf person from my film, my friend, Julie, like, I just want to tour with this and teach, right? Like, that's what, like, this was just another opportunity, a different platform for me to continue my passion of teaching and educating. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's really, you know, and if I could make some money along the way, because I was like, oh, I know that people will provide a stipend for someone if they like go speak or whatever like okay well it's got to be more money than you know making the (laughs) as a teacher right now and so I mean literally right now I have five jobs I have like five part-time jobs I'm I'm a bartender part-time I teach fitness classes part-time I teach part-time I do the film (laughs) yeah like you know and I love it. I love it all. But yeah, so distribution is like maybe a one in a million shot. I kind of how I look at it. So if I get it, I'll be thrilled. But if I don't get it, I'm not going to be devastated. Eventually, it'll get out there to the masses, mm-hmm. whether I have to release it on YouTube, which I'm fine doing, but I can't do that until I'm off the festival circuit. So festivals are very proprietary, like it can't be viewed for public consumption. You know, I can't stream it on YouTube and be accepted into a film festival. They're like, no, no, no. The masses have already seen it. We're not going to accept it into Uh the film festival. Some festivals are like, it has to be a world premiere or it has to be a premiere in this specific state or in this region. (laughs) So Uh Yeah, so sometimes you're disqualified from festivals if you've premiered elsewhere. Uh, it's, that's been also really kind of tricky and a, and a learning experience for me. So yeah, I mean, the goal, yes, I would love to get distribution on Netflix, Hulu, you know, Apple. Hey, Apple, <laughs> you've been a lifetime user. It would match Apple. really well with Coda, <laughs> right? So yeah, but I'm not going to let that deter me if a big platform, streaming platform service doesn't mm-hmm. pick it up. I'll I'll figure it out like I've been doing for the last eight years. I'll figure no, it out. Wonderful. <laughs> and and I guess speaking of the, the festival circuit, how has the initial kind of response been yeah. um, to the film? Yeah, so it's screened at two festivals so far. It premiered in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and it was really interesting contrasting that experience with the second festival, which was Athens, Ohio, just a few weeks ago. Mm. Santa Fe, the, it, it screened one time. The audience was predominantly deaf and hard of hearing. 
And it was received really well. It was like, thank you for telling our story. It, it was an interesting experience at that festival in the respect that there were some deaf attendees who asked the festival if any of the films were captioned mm -hmm. so that they could go and watch other films. And they were told no. We didn't have interpreters at some of the other events. So I chose not to go to the red carpet. I chose not to go to the filmmaker luncheon because it, mm. it wasn't fully accessible. Yeah. The building, the building that they screened it in actually wasn't um, wheelchair accessible. So I had a conversation with the festival producer about the whole kind of experience. And I'm going to be really honest. So Stephanie, if you are listening to this, you know, I thought that during that initial conversation, like she's like, oh, we're going to make some changes. This has been a learning experience. And I'm just, this woman is telling me what she thinks I want to hear to get me out of her office. Mm -hmm. And five days after the festival closed, maybe less than that, she sent me an email and she was like, hey, just wanted to let you know, we're going to make some changes, you know, to the the 2023 festival. And I, I looked at the email and there was a link and I didn't click on it. And like, Five hours later, I finally got the chance. I clicked on it and I read this press release that they sent out. And I just started bawling because the press release talked about the fact that my film brought awareness to the producer at the festival and that they were going to that they were going to request that all filmmakers provide a caption file for their film so that if there were deaf attendees at next year's festival, that they would have films accessible for them to watch. And I was just like blown away. I was like, okay. I was like, I didn't even think about this kind of impact that my film could have, but it made one. And that was incredible. Athens, Ohio festival was also incredible. It screened twice and it was all a hearing audience, no deaf people. And so the hearing audience was like, wow, we've learned so much. Never thought, never thought of this before. This was amazing. And I was like, oh my God. So it's interesting to see how the two different audiences react to it. Yeah. And I'll be, it's going to be in the heart at the Harlem Film Festival coming up in, or it will have, it yeah. will have screened <laughs> uh, at the Harlem Film Festival in May, the first weekend of May. And I have Dallas International Film Festival coming up in October. And I'm waiting to hear back from like 42 more festivals. Oh, so amazing though. Like I, I'm, I literally, I, I, and my arms are just covered in goosebumps like, oh. through this entire conversation because it's just so amazing, like so inspiring. And, and like, I don't even have words to describe it. Thanks. So I'm also really excited about having my film screened on Capitol in Washington, D.C. Senator Cory Booker is going to host a screening and then moderate a Q&A afterwards at the end. And I, I like I couldn't have dreamt of this happening, but I it, but it's happening and we're, you know, we're working on the date. And, you know, I'll definitely be announcing that just not only on social media, but through my email list that people can sign up for, you know, on my website on signtheshow.com. But I'm really hoping that that brings even more awareness and that there's more attendees because there's Gallaudet University in Washington, D.C., which is a deaf university. Mm -hmm. And I would just be like thrilled if students and faculty and administration from that college came to the screening on Capitol Hill and so thankful and grateful to Senator Booker for for doing that That's and it'll be it, yeah it'll be in September for Deaf Awareness Month oh my gosh that's huge that's huge that's so amazing. I cannot wait to, like I said, just follow along with the journey of uh, Sign the Show because it's I do, I can definitely see how you, I don't know, like we're drawn to this, I guess is maybe the way to say it. Like it's such an amazing cause and something again that like a lot of people don't consider. So it's wonderful to yeah. have someone who is getting it out there and sharing it with 
an audience, no matter how big or small, like it's, it's absolutely Thanks. amazing. Thank um, you. Oh, it's, <laughs> we could talk about this forever. Like it's, it's just so amazing. And you mentioned your social media and your website. And if, so if people want to kind of follow along and keep up with like the festivals where you're showing and just updates for the show, where can they do that at? So they can go to sign the show.com. It has links to all the social media, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. I'm not on TikTok. I, I am, but I'm not really on TikTok. <laughs> I have a page, but I don't. But definitely my website, signtheshow.com, links to all the social media handles there. And there is a place that you can sign up to get a monthly update, if that, barely once a month. <laughs> but I try to send out the update for all the festivals coming up and the dates where, where people can see it um, in a movie theater, you know, yes. not, not yet theatrically released for, you know, worldwide consumption, but at film festivals. So, oh, yeah. Amazing. And I'll be sure to include assignedshow.com and any other links in the episode description. And I will also say that you can, there's a trailer on signshow.com as well. Yeah. And it is, if you're not already pumped about this movie, <laughs> about this documentary, go and watch that trailer. Because like I said, it literally gave me goosebumps. And I was like, oh my God, but this is going to be absolutely amazing. So definitely go to signtheshow.com and check out Kat's documentary and follow social media and all of that. And Kat, I... I can't thank you enough for being on today. This oh my gosh, has been you're such so an welcome. Conversation. And I am, again, just so excited to kind of follow along on your journey. So thank you. Listeners, thank you so much for tuning in today. If you have questions or comments for any of my guests, including Kat, you can text or call us and leave a voicemail on our hotline, 252 419 six zero zero four and we will include answers to those questions on a future episode of the podcast so like i said if you have questions for cat definitely give us a call leave a voicemail send us a text and we will put together some answers to those questions and be sure to like rate review subscribe all that good stuff to the podcast and we will see you on next week's episode Thanks for listening to the Wandering Creatives Podcast, a CEI media production. Please like, rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast as it helps us greatly. You can follow us on Instagram at Wandering Creatives Pod and on Facebook at Wandering Creatives Podcast. If you would like to support the podcast, you can become a Patreon for just $5 a month. The link is in the episode description.